All oh. right, Carrie, thank you. So this is the first stop for the president at the Bridge of the Americas after that brief uh, moment there on the tarmac where he spoke with the likes of Governor Greg Abbott. He spoke with Mayor Oscar, uh, El Paso Mayor Oscar Leeser, El Paso County Judge Ricardo Samaniego. We saw DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas there, uh, deep planning as well as Congresswoman Veronica Escobar. So the first stop here is at the Bridge of the Americas. I believe, I, I don't know if uh, production, we can pull up the map that shows at least what we know at this time the couple of spots uh, that he is expected to go. So this is stop one, stop two will then be the El Paso County uh, Migrant Processing Center, which is back near the airport. Uh, here is a look at that. That is uh, just off of Montana. Uh, that is where we have ABC 7's Rosemary Montanez standing by. So we do have to complete team coverage of the president's visit, and we'll be able to uh, visit different locations uh, throughout this coverage. But this is stop number one. Uh, let's talk about stop number one first. Uh, we, we touched on it a moment ago, Bridge of the Americas. Uh, it is not downtown it is not where we saw migrants sleeping on the streets at the Greyhound bus station which obviously has since uh, dissipated just in the last few days it is not near Sacred Heart Church which is where we've seen the most migrants camping out uh, of late so that is really where uh, the focal point of what has been going on at least from an optic standpoint that we've seen of late has been happening uh, this as you can tell on the map I mean downtown El Paso if you're looking at this is to the left of that yellow dot of where the Bridge of the Americas is everyone familiar with El Paso uh, this is a little ways away from there so uh, Richard I'll start with you what do you make of the president visiting here first well I mean it's it's particularly sanitized given the fact that when uh, previous presidents have come uh, you'll remember that President Obama actually toured the same facility uh, that visit was largely about trade and when when President George W Bush came he actually had a press conference under the bridge of the Americas and that that really laid out the significance I think this is uh, as much as the White House is willing to let the president be as, as close to uh, the the immigrants and if you've been downtown you've seen that, that it is a, a pretty uh, stark site. Now, I think to <clears throat> Mayor Margo's point, I think one of the challenges uh, that this administration has is essentially juggling two immigration questions. You've got the existing immigration structure, which um, quite frankly is amnesty by default because ICE and CBP don't have the resources nationally uh, to go after every employer, every company, every uh, community that, that has folks that are undocumented. And that's been ongoing, uh, as the mayor correctly points out now, for decades. Mm -hmm. uh, but the second tier of the problem, which is what we're seeing right now, uh, is a confluence of issues. So, in fact, there has been some legal challenge uh, to the issue at hand, but, but primarily uh, we have asylum laws that are on the books that allow people to seek asylum. And one of the challenges under the Trump administration was essentially to look around those laws. And and some of that, I think, was was overtly political. Some of that was an attempt to deal with, with the COVID crisis. But I think now the administration is has fumbled this. And, and I think that it's, it's very hard to imagine that this many years into the president's administration, A, he hasn't been to the border and B, that they didn't anticipate some of these challenges, especially with Title 42. Um, when you spoke with Secretary Mayorkas, I mean, at the end of the interview, uh, he essentially sort of said, well, the system is broken. Uh, and that's not entirely the, the best message for the head of DHS to, to be sending, because it means that they don't actually have the ability to deal with, as the mayor points out, um, some of the small pieces of this. And so I think what you're seeing is, is probably effective. I think this is probably good uh, for people that are on the ground. So these are the, the folks that work for for CBP uh, and ICE, it's always helpful to get acknowledged, and in mm -hmm. that sense, I think this is important. Uh, but I don't necessarily know that this is going to change the conversation from the president's perspective. It certainly underscores the complexity of the border, where you have an economy that depends on a good relationship between the two nations that are on the border, but also the other issues include security and migration and uh, and you know amnesty. All of these issues tie together um, it, and of course it seems that each side will choose one over the other um, and, and that's where the comprehensive immigration reform comprehensive being the key word needs to be figured out um, and like you said the when Mallorca said the system is broken he punted that uh, proverbial football back to Congress speaking of the the punting uh, and we're gonna see if we get an eye on the, the president here in a moment because his vehicle is just beyond the edge of that building that you just saw uh, driving by there we believe Bishop Mark Seitz was was in there uh, we mm -hmm. saw him get in as well I uh, didn't see anyone else uh, other than Secret Service get, get in at the tarmac so I'm not sure if there's anyone else in there right now but we'll keep an eye on this uh, keep this picture up to see if we get a visual of him walking into the building there uh, but Mayor Margo, I'm curious from your vantage point, I mean, you've, you've been in, involved in a lot of these conversations behind closed doors. How much do you get a sense that some, some true reform 
is actually wanted to be accomplished because we're constantly in political election cycles and we see so frequently this used as the political flashpoint whether it be Republican led or Democratic led because it just depends on who's in power at the given moment and obviously when when President Trump was president the eyes were here on El Paso with separation of, of children the camp in Tornillo we saw we, we reported I remember reporting out live at the Clint Border Patrol facility when conditions were being reported of what was happening that was part of a congressional delegation uh, that visited uh, Hondo Pass was one of the locations there where we saw uh, when you were mayor the temporary facility uh, that was erected there by Border Patrol just to help process and house uh, migrants through that uh, processing standpoint. I'm just curious from your vantage point and all the conversations you had, is there truly a way to get something done when we're constantly in this political cycle and it's used so much as a political flashpoint? Only if it's bipartisan. And Only how likely is that? Well. Because you know, it's, they're the, so the, polarized. Right I now. agree, Eric. But the irony of it, and I brought mayors down here to the Tornillo uh, temporary place for unaccompanied minors back before everything was really hitting. Um, it, it's going to be bipartisan. What I what I when I brought the mayors down, I brought mayors from New York, L.A., and country and cities in between, is to try to explain to them back and during that time frame, the migrants weren't just staying on the border. They were going to their communities in Rhode Island, in Vermont, and elsewhere. They were, you know, Miami, wherever. They were going all over the United States, Chicago, everywhere. And that, that the issue is not a border issue. It's, a, it's an issue for the entire United States of America. We need migrants. We're a country of, of immigrants. Uh, but, but it needs to be a rational process. And they need to quit arguing. You know, my, uh, in my, uh, the first thing we need to do is border security. And I'm not sure. It's not a physical structure the whole way. You talk to, to experts with CBP and elsewhere. You can do some physical structures. They like that to a certain extent because it, it forces the flow to certain areas. But as you look along the Texas border, which is the largest area, mm -hmm. most of the land is owned privately. Right. And geographically, you can't do it. So it's going to take technology and it's going to take manpower. And my position was you tell Homeland Security, define for us what is a secure border as a as a sovereign nation for the United States and then fund them let them decide not a politico not a president says build a wall I mean that's it, it has to be the homeland security fulfilling their duties and obligations to protect us as a sovereign nation well that was one of the five points uh, in Governor Abbott's letter number five was used taxpayer money to build the border wall and and finish but not wall. but it's it's only part and parcel that's that's only a piece of a right. full Thing. It sounds like what you were saying earlier, it really is dependent on having staffing when it comes to being able to construct a flow of people. It, if you're talking about trying to process migration papers, whether they be uh, some sort of visa or asylum, um, this is about being able to process that paperwork. ICE is supposed to do the screening. Yeah. They're supposed to determine are they here for true asylum or is this an economic issue? and in which case they may not qualify. Then you need the immigration judges to make the final call. We're short, somebody said, 12,000 immigration judges. I don't know if it's, it's probably at least 1,000 short to be able, they could also deal with the 10 to 12 million we already have here in the United States that have been here for 20, 10, 15, 20 years to determine their process. But ultimately, my position that I put out it says, Let's take away that other political football says how they're going to vote, Democrat or Republican, and only allow them to have a green card status once, once approved. Then they work, they pay, they pay taxes, and I don't believe most of them are here to vote in the United States anyway. They're here to take care of their families for economic opportunity. All the interviews you all have done and others networks have done say I'm here because I can't, I can't survive where I am in Honduras or elsewhere or wherever. Right. Whatever. Looking for a better life. I want a better life, which is, you know, as far as I know, we're the only nation people are scrambling to get into, except for some of the uh, European countries. Right. So uh, put it together, put it to bed politically, do the security, tell them that they're going to get the opportunity for a green card, but they're not going to be able to be a citizen and vote. That takes away that whole argument that, that, that becomes so political. 
We want to get to Rosemary Montañez. She is at the next stop, the County Processing Center. Uh, and, and Rosemary, you're out there. Tell us, uh, as we are preparing for the president who is currently touring the, the Bridge of the Americas, what do you see out there? Well, Stephanie, Eric, let me tell you, there is a lot of movement happening at the County Processing Center. It's only about five minutes away from the El Paso International Airport. I want to give you a look at what we're seeing. There is a large law enforcement presence presence here. This is the intersection of Boeing and Lockheed Drive, where this center is located. There is units from the El Paso Police Department, from the sheriffs. We've also seen a lot of unmarked units, you know, just driving by this area and really this entire Entire intersection this side and the other side where Montana is located has been closed off. Now this center we are expecting President Biden to at some moment come here. We can actually see there was a white tent that was set up right in front of that migrant processing center. But why would President Biden be coming here? Well, back in September, if you all remember, the county actually opened this center to be able to process migrants a whole lot quicker here. This is what we were seeing thousands of migrants migrants coming in, Venezuelans as well. Uh, up to 600 migrants were being processed here at the moment. And to give you a little bit of understanding of what we're seeing today, about an hour ago, we saw a dozen, a dozen migrants, you know, walking out of this center. So obviously there is a lot of activity still happening, but President Biden is expected to be looking at this center. You know, this is a temporary center. Um, Migrants don't come here. They don't stay overnight, but rather, you know, they try to get to their final destinations. They're helped out with their with their buses. They're helped out with their flights. If they need uh, an air um, a hotel, they're helped out with those accommodations. But once again, we're expecting President Biden to visit this location. Um, what time? We don't know exactly at what time. But once again, I can tell you there is a lot of movement here. You know, we are expecting him to come here. Of course, it is. There's a lot a large police presence at this moment. But for now, I'll toss it back to you all in the studio. All right, Rosemary, thank you. We also have ABC 7's Dylan McKim, who is in northeast El Paso at Hondo Pass at the Border Patrol Station there. I mentioned that a moment ago. That is not at this time on the president's uh, itinerary. It's just the two stops we've showed you and then ultimately back to the airport. Of course, his initial itinerary also did say open press mm -hmm. upon landing. We did not hear from the president upon landing. We did hear from Governor Greg Abbott. Uh, but I do know, and I've seen uh, Dylan tweeting out uh, from his location there at Hondo Pass, that's where a lot of protesters of President Biden's visit have showed up. So let's check in with ABC 7's Dylan McKim, live in Northeast El Paso, outside the Border Patrol Station there at Hondo Pass. Dylan, what are you seeing out there? Yeah, Eric, you're exactly right. This location is not on the president's itinerary, but it is a popular stop for a lot of federal officials who do come to visit El Paso. We saw Vice President Kamala Harris come here. We saw DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. He spoke to Border Patrol agents behind these, these fences. And you see these flags behind me. These are the protesters here. I want to actually turn our camera over to the right. Uh, down lining here at Hondo Pass, there's about between 40 and 50 protesters here uh, that are protesting the President Biden's visit, President Biden's border policies. I've spoken with them. Uh, a lot of them say they are they're upset with what they call as open border policies. They're afraid of the drugs that come in here. They're afraid they don't know of who's coming into the country uh, as we see this migrant crisis happening in downtown El Paso uh, at our border. Irene Armendariz Jackson actually is the one who organized this protest. If you remember, she ran for U.S. Congress uh, as a Republican and lost her election against Veronica Escobar. She's responsible for this protest today. Uh, you can see a lot of American flags out here. Don't tread on me flag here. We have a flag waving in front of our camera right there. Uh, we see an impeach signs. Uh, we also have a lot of MAGA hats and uh, a lot of let's go Brandon signs out here. But in that in that group right now is Bill Jackson. He is the husband of Irene Armandar Armandaris Jackson. He worked for Border Patrol for 24 years. He actually retired or left the agency in December of 2021. So about a year ago, he worked just under a year for the Biden administration. I spoke to him today about the differences between working as a Border Patrol agent underneath the Trump administration and now the Biden administration and what he, his take is on the crisis we're seeing today. Go ahead and listen to what he had to say. Unfortunately, there seems to be a lot of chaos at the border because there's no deterrent anymore. Uh, agents are called out of the field 
into processing positions, allowing our borders to be unprotected. And thank God we have a good governor that's allowed their uh, DPS and state police to get out there and give us a hand. Uh, but the thing is, we're still getting a lot of illegal entries, getaways, they call them, and then also uh, a lot of drugs pouring across our border. So as you said, Eric, uh, President Biden, his itinerary, it does not say he's coming here to the Central Processing Center for Border Patrol up here on the Northeast on Hondo Pass. You can hear those cars honking uh, past me. We've been hearing cars honking all day since we've been out here, since the protesters had set up. Uh, some honks are for in support of the protesters and some honks are against the protesters. Uh, but we are still waiting to see if President Biden will actually make a stop here. Uh, and actually, Arm uh, Armandaris Jackson, she actually told her supporters out here that if he does not come to this processing center, they're ready to move to go where he is going to be. They talked about going down to Sacred Heart. They talked about going to the county processing center where we see Rosemary's at. Uh, of course, we are going to be uh, staying out here. We're going to be moving around all day uh, to, to show you what's happening as the president makes this historic visit to the southwest border. But I'm going to send things back to you reporting live out here in Northeast. Dylan McKim, ABC7. All right, let's take a live look at uh, President Biden right now and their secretary, DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. They're meeting with uh, CBP agents as well as a Border Patrol looks like in this picture right now, or CBP actually, that is also black uniform there. So all CBP agents at the uh, Bridge of the Americas just outside of the area there. So this is a live look right now. You are looking live at President Joe Biden on the ground in El Paso meeting with CBP agents, shaking hands with the agents right now having conversations about the immigration crisis, what has been going on, particularly here in El Paso. What we've seen here is El Paso has become the focal point of this crisis over the last several months amidst all the talk about Title 42 uh, potentially being lifted at some point, going all the way up to the Supreme Court just a few weeks ago, still being allowed to be in place. There was a line in there in that ruling, though, that allows the president to lift it still if he wants to while other things play out in the courts. However, at this time, uh, that has not happened. And of course, uh, Joe Biden there, uh, the president, uh, along with the DHS secretary in the white shirt with his back to our, our camera right now is Alejandro Mayorkas, who Stephanie Valle just interviewed uh, exclusively the other day ahead of this uh, planned visit uh, from the president, of course, donning the aviators that he is so well known uh, to be wearing as well and sharing a little bit of a smile in a moment there with some of the CBP agents. But this is something that you know, I think a lot of Republicans probably looking at this, uh, what we heard from Senator John Cornyn and others, and even uh, Gre Governor Greg Abbott mentioning it on the tarmac a moment ago, that this cannot merely be a photo op and, and a, 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 just a stop by. There has to be real progress that comes from this. But of course, that's something that we hear uh, time and time again, regardless of who's in power, uh, is not making these trips into photo ops, but actually turning into some type of action. Uh, Stephanie, we are seeing the president live mm -hmm. on the ground right here. Uh, he is making his way a little bit closer to a camera location. Uh, again, on the itinerary that they gave us, uh, there was supposed to be an open press opportunity. We, we expected um, somewhere on the tarmac or right after he got off the plane. Right. Let's listen in here and see if we can hear anything. It appears as though uh, the CBP officers are explaining to President how they screen vehicles uh, for any type of illegal objects or substances. Uh, you could see one of the officers running a, a, some type of gear around the tire wheel there, or the tire well of that vehicle. Again, this is the stop that the president has made in El Paso, other than a, obviously touching down at the El Paso International Airport. As you can see a map here, he was at the airport. He is now at the Bridge of the Americas. After that, he is set to go to the El Paso County Migrant Services Center that is near the airport. All of these locations are on the itinerary that we received from the White House. Didn't look like he was going to be headed to downtown El Paso, which is where we had seen many of the migrants who had uh, been living on the streets of Segundo Barrio. Um, but as you can expect, a lot of traffic in the areas where the president is right now. 
is blocked off at this point. We are getting word uh, from the White House about what was discussed on Air Force One in the moments before they touched down in El Paso. We heard from Alejandro Mayorkas. He addressed uh, that he was going to be uh, talking about the asylum programs. He's the, the White House had just uh, put into place earlier la or late last week, saying that they have seen um, 100 Border Patrol agents surged in El Paso. They're on Tuesday going to be opening up a new soft-sided facility that is going to be able to process up, uh, process up to 1,000 migrants. They've also surged up emergency food and shelter, programming funding, and giving an extension on the expenditure of the funding already provided. Also talking about asylum programs, again, all of this happening on Air Force One as they were making their way to El Paso. They're trying to broadly incentivize safe and early ways to cut out smuggling operations. So what they're trying to do is have to incentivize people to go to the ports of entry instead of going between the ports of entry. So again, just some of the points that we are hearing uh, discussed on the Air Force One as President Joe Biden arrived in El Paso for his first visit to the border in his nearly two years in office. And Stephanie, this is something uh, I want to clarify too. This is the White House uh, press pool camera uh, that we're seeing now. So that's why you see some of the movement, some of the zooming in and out. Uh, they are mobile and moving along the designated spots that they are allowed to as well. And a moment ago there, while you were talking, Stephanie, they zoomed out wide a little bit, gave us a little bit better perspective as to what the setup is like right now. Instead of doing this inside, they actually had, they had a table in the, in the foreground set up uh, with a few looks like demonstrations set up for the president as well as the vehicle you were touching on a moment ago. Now they're looking uh, in, a, in a different direction, but when that camera zoomed out, it gave us a little bit more of kind of like a show and tell setup, uh, and they make it out in the open for us to see here, or at least the press pool to see, and then allow us to show that to you. What do you make of kind of a show and tell? Um, again, we're not seeing him talk directly to, to migrants. We didn't expect that. Uh, he's not in downtown in a less secure area. He's in a very secure space with a very coordinated setup presentation. I mean, it's, it's going to be hard not to be critical of this first part of the visit, Eric, especially given the fact that what, what he is looking at is sort of the, the tools of the trade. I, I think that bodes well for those CBP officers. I think it certainly is a vote of confidence, but I think to address the issue that's at hand and the reason that he's here, it seems a, a little bit short-sighted. I mean, you're, you're seeing them in front of the big x-ray truck mm -hmm. uh, that's used to look at semis, and it looks like the congressional delegation was uh, off to the right. You could see uh, some of the, the members that came along on the plane. Uh, I, I mean, I think that this is, is helpful to have the president be here. Certainly great for these officers to, to meet the commander-in-chief, uh, but it doesn't get to the heart of the issue. And, and quite frankly, the, the process that happens at the Bridge of the Americas is commercial traffic. There, there are not uh, facilities there to process individuals. And so, you know, maybe the tone of this will change uh, when he goes to the county facility. But but so far, I mean, this is this is very much a dog and pony show. Yeah, maybe that's one half of it because obviously part of this is, you know, drug smuggling, stopping that. And of course, at the ports, they're very successful in defending the border and, and protecting the border and this is the technology that is used to do that but the problem at the heart of the hands that we're at the, at the heart of the issue that we're talking about you touched on right now is migration and the flow of human beings in addition to drug trafficking but but particularly uh, migration and that is not something that's being uh, much addressed at least in terms of what we can see right here but to your point maybe that's stopped too well he's visiting with the blue suitors um, that's Director of Field Operations, yeah. Hector Mancha and his staff, who wear the blue uniforms. CBP on the border for protection is are the green, green. suitors. That's Border Patrol, yeah. That is, the, you know, he's there to see where we first come through, and those are the port of entries, though, where you would want the migrants to go through first and then be, be screened by ICE if they have the staffing, right. which historically they have not had. But, but... Uh, Hector, and that's what Governor Abbott yeah. wanted by creating the, the razor wire. They, their justification for that along the Rio to was channel. to channel it to the ports so exactly. that they could be going through the ports as opposed to exactly. in between. Exactly, but, the, but the, the, they're still short. Even before the migrant crisis, how many times did you come over from the Brit, from what is over the bridge and find four of our lanes are closed? Right. We haven't had full staffing since 1996 when 100, approximately 165 of, of, uh, of, the, of the bridge staff was moved to San Isidro, and then all they did was reduce the manning tables down and say, this is, this is normal. They need at minimum 165 more just on our one bridge alone. 
And it just, it's just, uh, it, again, you go back to the basic funding and staffing. And, and until Congress gets their act together to decide, was well, it more important to send $85 billion to the IRS or $65 billion to CBP, it's, it's, a, it's a debate. But it's, it's a political debate driven by those we elect, so it's up to us. Well, according to uh, the White House readout on Air Force One, Mayorkas mentioned that the president will see, um, he says, I will tell you one thing I think he's going to see is the incredible work of U.S. Customs and Border Protection of the border federal agents, the field office personnel, as well as to support others. So again, this is um, like we were talking about. This is him coming out and speaking to the people who are at the ports dealing day to day with what we're seeing in terms of commercial traffic but again um, and, and it's and like you said it's great for the employees the agents and the officers who are working at the ports of entry who are, are dealing with low staffing and trying to process commercial vehicles and stop drugs from coming into the United States uh, but like I mentioned earlier this is a multi-pronged sure. issue that we see here at the border which is migration and also security and that makes it they still have needs and they still have a message that they right. want to get to the president whether you're the dark uniform or the green uniform there are needs across the board to what you were touching across on, board. Mayor Margo. Mm -hmm. I do want to point out, too, obviously, uh, the president is looking inside one of these uh, vehicles right now. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see him get in it at some point, maybe, you know, get behind the wheel. He's done that in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, I want to point out, when this camera was zoomed out a little bit more, we did once again get our second visual. Uh, since since the everyone got off the plane off of Air Force One at the airport, we saw Congresswoman Veronica Escobar, along with El Paso Mayor, uh, Oscar Leeser, as well as County Judge Ricardo Samaniego as part of this visit, shaking hands there with Alejandro Mayorkas uh, just in the foreground of that shot a moment ago as well. So uh, that delegation, that contingent is part of this. Of course, the governor, Greg Abbott, is not. And he got a lot of time there to speak uh, to all of the, the press pool on the tarmac outside of Air Force One. You know, Eric, one of the things that's challenging uh, about, and I, I think this is what the mayor's been speaking to, um, comprehensive immigration reform, first off now, really depends on who defines it. Um, so it's, it's, it's thrown around a lot, but the problem is individual politicians and parties have their own take on that. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, and to a certain extent, I think this is what you're seeing sort of visualized here, one of the challenges is we have to both maintain the security and integrity of the border, as the mayor points out, and we've got to make sure that our migration policy is up to speed. I think uh, President George W. Bush came closest uh, in 2001 uh, by, by pushing for a guest worker program that allowed for migrants to cross uh, a little bit more freely, but then the problem is September 11th happened, and from that point forward, truly, one of the challenges is you cannot talk about locking down the front door of the house, but leaving windows open for, for other pieces, right? Th those two things linguistically mean that you're always going to have a challenge with immigration policy, and I think to a certain extent you're seeing some of this now. Th these are important pieces to be absolutely sure, but it's hard to manage that while also talking about the way that you're going to manage the asylum policies uh, that the country has. And also because, um, like many people say, this is up to Congress to come up with these policies that are enacted and, and put into law. The, the executive branch can only do so much when it comes to enforcing policies, and those policies can be undone by the following um, administration because we've seen that happen years over in the past. So we see uh, that he does have members of Congress here, but they are all from one party. We just saw uh, on Friday that the Republican side of the House had a struggle in electing their House Speaker. So how do we get to a point where we're able to come to an agreement when one side can't even agree on, on their speaker? I, I think that that's, uh, again, sort of the heart of the challenge that, that, as the mayor pointed out, this has become politically charged. I think that there are two pressing issues, and one where I think uh, people that have served along the border, I think, really can, can fit into this conversation as uh, the economic interest in the country. Because one of the things that's also not discussed, Stephanie, is that you still have a lot of corporate interests that are pulling. That, that serves as the pull for migration if they know that there's work in poultry processing or in agricultural uh, institutions. And so have some of those business people be at the table 
table for these conversations because truly they're the engine that drives some of the economic imperatives. On the political side, I think the mayor's right. I think uh, some of these questions of asylum seeking, I mean, this was supposed to be in the vice president's wheelhouse. It doesn't look like any movement has happened since the, since the term started. Uh, but we clearly have a political issue in Latin America with the Northern Triangle countries uh, where there's a, a lot of political issues that have to be handled uh, by, by the State Department. So I, I think this is one of those things that it's easy to say we want to do X policy, but they always have implications to everything else that we do. And uh, again, I think as long as, you know, I, there is a certain argument, and, and I'm, I'm more inclined to uh, believe this, that, that this is beneficial to have gridlock for both parties at this point on immigration. Um, they benefit from being able to say, uh, Republicans being able to say the Democrats want an open border and it's a dangerous invasion force. The Democrats being able to say the Republicans are racist and they don't want these people here. A and it's convenient for both parties to continue down that line uh, because it means that they speak to their base. And, and you're seeing that. I mean, the protests on the Northeast uh, act as if there was nothing that happened over the last four uh, and a half years, or uh, the four years that the, the Trump administration was in, in office. And so, I mean, you know, it's but, easy to look past some of that. But, but you know who that doesn't benefit? Us. El Paso, us. our community. But let, yeah, let, let's, let's go beyond that. But I would love to see the president appoint a bipartisan group in the Senate and a bipartisan group in Congress in the House and say, come up with immigration reform, whether it be omnibus or piecemeal. My own limited uh, position in the, in the state legislature said to, to me, a step-by-step uh, -step does better than omnibus bills, mm -hmm. okay? So start with whatever it needs to be, but have them work in a bipartisan way and let him appoint it and be the leader he should be for this. And I've not seen it anywhere. I mean, I just keep hearing nobody wants to work with the other side. 